on behalf of the Stage Institute and the Minister of Education, I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. As part of the Global Forum held yesterday, Dr. Campbell has kindly accepted our invitation to offer us a public lecture on the peace of the Korean Peninsula and the unification of two Koreas. Dr. Campbell doesn't require my introduction. However, if I may, Dr. Campbell is the chairman and CEO of the Asia Group he founded in 2013. He is also chairman of Washington-based think tank called Center for New American Security that he co-founded in 2007. As many of us know, he served the first Obama administration as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Previously, Dr. Campbell served in several capacities in government, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia and the Pacific and Director of the National Security Council staff. For his distinguished service to the U.S. government, he received the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award and the Department of Defense Medals for Distinguished Public Service. And also, his diplomatic efforts were also recognized by the Queen with the Order of Australia and the New Zealand Order of Merit. Many Korean experts, including myself, came to know him through his influential policy work at the Center for Security and International Affairs, where he was the senior vice president and Kissinger Chair. In addition to his outstanding services for the U.S. government and policy community in the U.S., he was an academic part at Harvard University. All these distinguished services led me to characterize Dr. Campbell as a unique leader with multiple roles as a high-ranking government officer, a think tank builder, and a star. If I may add to his personal bio, he is also known in Washington, D.C. as a proud husband, married to Ryan Bernard, the former Under Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, and now joining the Federal Reserve Board as a government. Across his distinguished career, Dr. Campbell has been a strong advocate for the importance of the Asia Pacific region to the U.S. interests. Considering his outstanding background, his lecture title, Changing Global Attitudes to Korean Unification, will be very valuable to us. I am grateful that he has agreed to take a Q&A session to answer challenging questions from the audience after his lecture. Since we are very eager to listen to his lecture, without further ado, let us welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you very much, President. It's an honor to be back in Korea and to be here at the Global Forum. As I look into the crowd, I see so many distinguished uh, Korean specialists, people who've dedicated their lives and their scholarship to uh, advancing peace and prosperity in the Asia Pacific region. It's a little humbling, but it's an honor to be here. I'll do my best to at least provide some insights into what we're facing currently, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but more generally in Asia as a whole. And again, I just want to thank very much the chairwoman for inviting me here today. As she indicated, my wife was recently confirmed as uh, governor of the Federal Reserve, and so we have, we always had a boss in our family, but we have a real big boss now. So, um, so I have to balance my schedule with hers, and I'm just very grateful that I had the opportunity to come today. So before we talk about the Korean Peninsula, I think it would be valuable to it's always important when you look at a particular issue to put it in a strategic context. And I came from Washington. I want to give you, at least from my perspective, sort of an unvarnished sense of what we are facing right now uh, in the United States and in global politics, per se, and what that means then specifically for the Korean Peninsula. Um, I, I've worked on international relations for decades. I do not remember a time in which there is as much turmoil and uncertainty uh, about uh, not only developments that are taking place in Ukraine, 
uh, in the Middle East and South Asia, uh, but uh, essentially across the globe. I think we've normally thought of the Asia Pacific region as a place of peace and prosperity, enormous prospects for advancement, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves in recent years. There are also beneath the surface more signs of tension, and these are not tensions that come from the usual sources, not just uh, developments with respect to North Korea or uncertainties across the Taiwan Strait. In fact, if anything, the Taiwan Strait has been uh, peaceful and uh, uh, moving in a positive direction. Indeed, it is the dynamics between the larger states in Asia and what that means going forward. I think at the heart of what we're facing in the United States, though, is a set of uh, developments in the Middle East that are drawing the United States uh, back into a series of challenges that are unforgiving. Um, we have made uh, profound and deep commitments uh, in the Middle East over the course of now almost two decades. It's extraordinarily important that we undertake those commitments with responsibility. But one of the things that we try to articulate in government is that by any measure, the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Asia Pacific region. And that if we are not careful, we, the United States, are not going to have the role that we would like to play. And that we need to take steps to link our prosperity, our dynamism, more closely to the Asia Pacific region. The Middle East is enormously important. We have huge interests there, but what we are seeing on a daily basis is just intractable problems that are extraordinarily difficult to confront, and we need to somehow find the time in this incredibly difficult and busy agenda to focus on the Asia Pacific uh, more uh, as we go forward. Now, this will be a project that is not linked to one president, or indeed two. This will be a longer-term effort that you will see group from over a considerable period of time. One of the relatively inane dialogues that we had occasionally in Washington was this back and forth in which someone would say, look, we're back in Asia. And then someone else would respond by saying, um, we've never left, right? And in truth, both of these concepts have elements of truth, and I would argue uh, are inadequate to understanding the challenges of the Asia Pacific region. It is true that for now, 15 years, we have spent an enormous period of time focusing on the Middle East and South Asia. And that's just not the senior time and attention of our senior leaders, but the kinds of people that we educate and train in our governments, in our military, in our intelligence, in our State Department, they're much more focused on the Middle East. And we're going to need to do more if we're going to be effective in Asia as a whole going forward. And so I think it is undeniable that we, in fact, have been somewhat preoccupied away from the dynamism of the Asia Pacific region. But it is also the case, just because we initially had focused attention on the rising East and have attempted to construct a diplomacy, a military, and commercial strategy that accords with the dynamism of the Asia Pacific region, doesn't mean that we're back. In fact, what is happening in Asia, even though the United States has a very strong basis and a, I think, a very good history of engagement in the Asia Pacific region. The region demands more now. So what used to pass as an effective American engagement and role no longer cuts it. And so we fundamentally have to step up our game going forward. And those demands are unyielded, and they are required across the board, not just in US strategic engagement with China, but also our bilateral relationships and also um, increasingly in multilateral fora. I would argue that one of the most important contributions of the United States in the period ahead is lending our ingenuity and time to the dynamism that we are seeing in the building of multilateral institutions. And the most important thing we can do, at least for a period of time, is just show up. You would be, you would be astonished sometimes how difficult those arguments can be in a difficult domestic or international situation to make the case to political advisors why the president or the vice president or the secretary of state has to spend seven or eight or ten days uh, in the Asia Pacific region. It is unbelievably obvious to most of us that work in this capacity, but others have questions about it. That will have to change over time as we go forward. 
Um, I, I would also say that one of the most important things that is taking place is not well understood uh, outside of the United States. I'm not even sure it's understood in the United States. And it has to do with what's going on between the political parties in the United States. Obviously, there are enormous divisions between Republicans and Democrats. But what is much more important is what is going inside, going on inside the parties, right? So essentially, since the Vietnam War, the, the Democratic Party has been profoundly divided between the internationalist group and a group that is more suspicious about exercising American power, particularly military power. And so what we have essentially seen is a strategy in the world, strong alliances, for deployed engagement, pro-trade, that is the consequence of an unusual and sometimes uneasy alliance between internationalist Democrats and the whole of the Republican Party. And what's fascinating, for a party that before 1940 had very deep strains of isolationism and suspicion about the global uh, order, since the Second World War, the Republican Party has essentially been united around the precepts of American engagement on the international stage. What is not, I think, as widely understand is for a variety of reasons. Profound distrust about this president, questions about fiscal discipline, uh, worries that uh, we're involved in conflicts unending. What is developing is a substantial fissure in the Republican Party now. And there is a very active, it's really not an isolationist wing, but a libertarian wing that is raising questions about every aspect of American engagement. I took a group of congressmen and senators not long ago to Japan, about um, almost 30. I was not surprised at many Democrats raising questions about the Korea Free Trade Agreement and uh, the prospects for TPP, but what did surprise me was how many Republicans raised questions about our military engagement in Asia. Why are we spending all this money? Why can't other countries step up? What's in it for us, right? And so I think one of the most important tasks for the next President of the United States and the people around him or her will be to articulate not just tactics for how to deal with these unbelievably difficult issues in Syria or Afghanistan or elsewhere, but articulating a larger vision for why the United States needs to be engaged in the world and why that matters to our prosperity. Now, I would argue that that argument is quite clear. If we were to recapture the dynamism, some of the lost jobs that occurred after 2007 and 2008, the only way to do that is through a substantial increase in exports. And when we talk about what's the appropriate word for what we're trying to do in Asia, in truth, on the economic side, it is truly a rebalance. And if you think about it from basically 50,000 feet, what we are attempting to accomplish, if you look backwards, what we have done over the last 30 years is invest substantial uh, uh, financial capacity in building manufacturing and other kinds of service industries across Asia, and particularly in China. And China subsequently has it, um, exported dramatic amounts of goods and services mostly goods to the United States. That's led to some global imbalances. The period ahead will fundamentally need to involve a couple of dynamic changes. One of those will be the United States will have to be much more hospitable to dramatic increases in foreign investment. Now, even though the United States and China are remarkable beneficiaries of global interdependence, I know of no two countries that are occasionally more uncomfortable than in, with interdependence. And we're going to need to learn to accept and understand that substantial investment in the United States from China and elsewhere is going to be in our strategic best interest. But correspondingly, Asia has to become more um, uh, open and accepting of uh, American manufacturing and services to help rebalance the Asia Pacific equation that is so essential going forward. But in this environment, with such deep divisions between the two parties, articulating a vision uh, for uh, uh, the future is going to be essential. Now, one of the things I see a lot of friends in the audience, some Democrats, some Republicans, we take um, pride and we feel good about the fact that essentially, despite fighting around elections, there is a bipartisan core 
around Asia-Pacific uh, uh, endeavors. Engagement of China, the opening to Burma, maintaining peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. The key will be whether we can sustain this going ahead uh, amidst all of these challenges elsewhere in the world, and also obvious fiscal and political challenges in the United States. And so I, I do want to just underscore that the challenges that we face are enormous. In Asia, our problems are uh, uh, also manifest. Um, we are involved in an extraordinarily complex set of diplomatic engagements with China that are essentially, in my view, about how the United States and China can and must coexist in the 21st century. And around that are a series of engagements around military issues, cybersecurity, uh, matters uh, uh, relating to economic policy. Um, I think for many people, I, this is the 40th anniversary of the opening to China, the dramatic opening to China. My essential experience is that I find myself, I often go to meetings with the founders, the, the, the architects of the early uh, U.S. policy from China. And generally speaking, they look at the current generation of policymakers as uh, not being up to the task. And I, I understand that. I recognize that. And, and I think they, they have some serious concerns about U.S.-China policy. But I would offer one thing for us to consider. You know, the policies that you undertake in the United States, that we undertook in the 1970s and 1980s, luring out, engaging a country that had chosen self-isolation, that had no economic or international engagement whatsoever. Those policies are very different than the policies that one has to contemplate today. When you're trying to shape the choices and the approaches of the country that has risen to great power status faster than any country in the world, faster than the United States at the end of the 19th century, right? So by nature, there's going to be more tension and difficulty in the relationship. During my period as Assistant Secretary of State, I spent thousands of hours with my counterparts. Personally, I have enormous confidence in the U.S.-China relationship, and I believe that we can work through our challenges and our problems. But for anyone who's watching, this is not for the faint of heart. This is not going to be easy, and if there is not tension in your engagements, if there is not profound occasional discord, then someone is not doing their job. And, and, and accommodating to that reality is one of the most important things at a psychological and political level that the United States must understand. In addition to that, we have extraordinary difficulties uh, in Northeast Asia that pains us, that pains us. We have no closer relationships than between the United States and Korea and the United States and Japan. And the fact that Korea and Japan literally can barely find an opportunity to sit in a room together pains us enormously. And it strains our um, understanding about how to approach these issues. I think the conventional wisdom in the United States is that you have to leave this alone. And you have to allow Seoul and Tokyo to work this out between themselves. We will try occasionally for some high-level engagement with the President brought Madam Park and Prime Minister Abe together in Europe, but essentially the process has to run its course. And I think there is a wisdom to this, but I take a very different view. I believe the fact that our two closest friends are in such this deep discord creates enormous problems for the United States. And I would like to see the United States playing a much more active role in basically insisting that these two countries, these two dear friends, find ways to work together and to accommodate each other's understandings and uh, approaches to complex problems. I think it's very important for the United States, and it is an issue uh, that I think clouds our overall engagement in Asia as a whole. In addition, there are also some positives that are taking place in Asia, things that, that I think uh, do not receive enough attention and uh, focus. I think the positive diplomacy between South Korea and China is the most important development in Asia uh, that I've seen uh, in over a decade. And it holds enormous pro uh, promise, not only for the Korean Peninsula, but for the process of engagement in Northeast Asia going forward. I find myself often in meetings uh, with, in China where my Chinese friends will point out that, 
look, we're, we're getting much closer to South Korea. You must not like this. And I say, no, I think it's a very positive development. It's very much in the best interests of South Korea and China for there to be greater understanding. I'm not sure Chinese friends always believe that. I think they wonder whether we're playing a similar zero-sum game. But I can tell you that most of my interlocutors in uh, the White House, the State Department, around Washington recognize that this development, that Madam Park is essentially really pioneered, is profoundly in the interests of Asia. And we have great confidence and trust in South Korea. And we know that South Korea, under no circumstances, is going to sacrifice its own strategic interests in any way uh, except to advance their own interests. And as part of that, a uh, careful strategic relationship with China as a whole. Um, I think uh, one of the enduring negatives uh, in Northeast Asia have been the recurring provocations and the almost complete lack of progress um, with North Korea. Um, I will tell you that I've worked on this. I've spent hundreds, thousands of hours over the last several years focusing on what are the essential ingredients for how we go about doing diplomacy with North Korea. Should we try secret diplomacy? Should we try to use outside interlocutors? Should we try to put together a grand bargain? Should we try to reconstitute six party and kind of look the other way with respect to North Korean violations to their own agreements that they signed? What I'm left with is trying to evaluate what success looks like, at least limited success in a different capacity. I think we have to recognize that yes, with respect to North Korea, we have been unsuccessful in getting them to understand that to join the community of nations, they must relinquish their nuclear weapons. And increasingly, we must deal differently in the domestic environment that they find themselves in. But ultimately, I think we have managed to keep our allies and friends relatively together around some overall global norms. We've maintained peace and stability. I think we've been very robust when we've confronted uh, 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 horrible atrocities like the sinking of the Chonan and the shelling of, uh, of the islands. Uh, I think that has demonstrated a strong and deep commitment between the United States and South Korea, and in fact, the international community uh, as a whole. And I think over time, at least my own personal experience suggests that gradually, slowly, slowly, Chinese friends have come to understand that the thing that uh, confronts China more than any far-fetched idea of containment uh, uh, conducted by the United States. What is undermining Chinese strategic interests in Asia is, is North Korea. That with every provocation, with every step, that North Korea is creating a security environment that is antithetical to China's strategic interests. And they come to appreciate that. I heard a very senior Chinese friend. I, I won't, he had served basically at the very top of the Chinese government in the Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao uh, administration. He had just come back from South Korea, and he had witnessed also the very positive and productive multifaceted visit of Xi Jinping uh, uh, to South Korea. And you know, with a smile and a, uh, sort of a smirk, he said, you know, increasingly it dawns on us that we have chosen the wrong Korea. And I think that sense is permeating strategic environments uh, in uh, Beijing and elsewhere. That does not mean that we will see a whole scale change in uh, uh, North Korean policy in China. That's just fanciful. But the sense that North Korea is working at odds uh, to Chinese strategic interests and that some of the assassinations and executions in North Korea uh, are sending a signal not just to the people of South, uh, North Korea, but frankly to China but directly, is not lost on Chinese interlocutors. So I would suggest to you that amidst this very uncertain picture in Northeast Asia, in fact, Asia as a whole, military coup in Thailand, uncertainty uh, 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 in the South China Seas, what we have seen uh, between South Korea and China is extraordinarily important. And I would hope that over time that that dialogue will extend beyond simple issues associated with advancing trade and exports to looking carefully and very discreetly at the future of the Korean Peninsula.
Now, I would suggest to Korean friends that one of the most important things that Koreans can do is to take a page from Chinese foreign policy. Now, if you ask yourself, what is the greatest success of Chinese foreign policy? I, there are many things that one might offer, but I would say the um, acceptance globally in almost every forum, in every strategic interaction, that there is but one China, right? Is a profound success of Chinese foreign policy. That was not the case just 30 years ago, but that has now been enshrined in every aspect of American and global strategic engagement with China. Now, um, I'm not going to quarrel, I'm not going to get into the dynamics of that, but I would simply say, is there any other place on the planet in which it is so obvious that this concept of unity, national, uh, almost sociological unity applies? It would be on the Korean Peninsula. And so in an environment like we are facing today, in which it is almost impossible with all the uncertainty and wariness that you see across uh, uh, Northeast Asia and globally, what are the steps that one can take behind the scenes to prepare the way going forward? And I believe Emil Bach and Madame Park have begun to take those steps. I think what Madame Park has done by enunciating the concept of a peaceful uh, transition towards unification is a very important concept. And I would love to see more Chinese friends here and others, but the fact remains that this has basically added a new issue um, to the global agenda. It has to be uh, uh, dealt with uh, directly. I also uh, would uh, argue that what we have seen generally is the concept that the idea that there is one Korea and there is one Korean people um, and that countries or groups that take steps to uh, maintain the division is increasingly becoming a concept that spans political parties in South Korea. And that's important going forward. And so I would simply say that in the past, one of the things that we saw was a number of states, including the United States, but also Japan, probably Russia, others had deep misgivings about the concept of unification. And in fact, in some of our most delicate and important planning documents, if we ever face instability, some of the ideas were not about how to move towards reunification, but how to reestablish some form of status quo and development. I think those concepts have now been relegated appropriately to the issue of history. Everyone now recognizes that it is in the best interests of all the Korean people to move consequentially towards this ultimate growth. Now, let us not uh, have any doubts that the challenges here are enormous. Um, we worked very hard with Korean friends on a number of scenarios associated with uncertainty in North Korea. Um, I personally was involved in many senior, senior high-level engagements. I can remember explaining once to a very senior White House official when we were about to do one of these scenario developments. He, he said, well, why are we doing this? We can't anticipate the conditions. There's so many. They're so uncertain. Why would we take the time to do this? And I remember responding to this person by saying, look, of course you can't anticipate what the details will be, but we have to prepare ourselves to at least think about these issues. You have to socialize yourself to the challenges that you will likely face with respect to refugees, the potential seepage of weapons of mass destruction, what you do with the elites, how do you manage issues associated with troops moving over borders, what kind of very important development diplomacy takes place with China, who leads that, is it South Korea, is it the United States? These are all things that have to be discussed going forward. And I remember at the end of one of these planning sessions, I came to the conclusion, I remember telling our friends that we really have two fundamental options when it comes to thinking about uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula and planning for it the best we can. And obviously we have ministries that do this on a regular basis, and there is a robust, a robust dialogue between the United States and South Korea. That has to be broadened. We have to bring other nations in, particularly China going forward. But I remember thinking to myself, we really face two fundamental options. One is we are ill-prepared, right? We are ill-prepared. And the other 
is that we are really ill prepared, right? <laughs> and so we must constantly strive for the first, right? We must simply be ill prepared. And we must do everything we can to take steps to think strategically and creatively about the way forward. But recognize that if and when this happens, and I personally believe it is a win, not a man, it will pose the greatest challenge to international diplomacy um, that we have faced uh, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in many respects, more difficult, I think, because of the uncertainties that take place between the United States and China. At the time, the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was much greater understanding between the United States and the former uh, Russia and the Soviet Union than there is today between the United States and China. And I take no pleasure in that going forward. So, what do we do in the um, uh, period as we think? We plan. Uh, we create a, um, a clear public dialogue and understanding about the notion of one Korea. And make it part of every aspect of diplomacy and, and really sociology of how do we think about Korea and one Korea. But there are other practical steps that we should take. The United States in the past has done an enormous amount in, uh, to support information in North Korea. Um, some of those programs have been cut. I will tell you, our good friend Frank Januzzi was the author of many things that allowed us to support these efforts for years. But we can do more. Information in North Korea is going to be extraordinarily important. And there are a number of ways that we can do this uh, to be more active. Secondly, you, you know, last year, the United States took in less than 50 North Koreans that left the country. South Korea's been very generous, but other countries have to step up and help to train and prepare a generation of North Koreans that undoubtedly at some point in the future will have opportunities to return. And so we have to think about that. We have to think about it in a, in a constructive way. I also think that we must always leave the door open for dialogue with North Korea. We cannot put North Korea in a set of circumstances where it feels like it has no other options. But at the same time, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and recognize that when we have tried to give North Korea a choice, right, and we've done this for 20 years, you can either choose a course of engagement uh, with the international community, support for your country, more economic engagement, or uh, you can uh, uh, live in relative isolation and hostility and maintain nuclear weapons. And the North Korean answer has always been both, as opposed to the choice, right? And they've tried to finish that. It's not clear that we'll be able to come up, frankly, with a strategy to try to accommodate this. I would love to see the six-party talks uh, restart, but I do wonder whether it's going to be possible and whether we'll have to contemplate new forms of dialogue, perhaps smaller groupings that will allow really uh, a, a clear dialogue with North Korea. I do want to say one other thing, if I might. Um, uh, if we face real serious provocations going forward with North Korea, I think we have to keep one option open. And I just want to be clear about this. When I worked at the State Department, you learn a lot of things in government. You learn a lot about what you thought compared to what actually is. I thought North Korea was the most heavily sanctioned country in the world uh, from the point of view of the United States. Nothing could be further than <laughs> So when we have tried to lift sanctions in Burma and Myanmar, it, comes, it becomes very clear that Myanmar is sanctioned about 10 times more than North Korea is. And it came as an enormous surprise to me. And the fact is that if we chose to, we could make life much more difficult through financial sanctions for North Korea. Um, it would create difficulties in China, but frankly, if we face the kinds of provocations we have in the past, we have to keep those options open. And I think one of the reasons that perhaps we kept this back door uh, there is always the hope that North Korea might be able uh, to find a way out. But unfortunately, if they continue along these lines of provocation, I think it would be very difficult to find our way forward. And I think the only way uh, to send a very clear signal to China, who I think will be instrumental in the domestic politics of North Korea is for us to step up our um, firmer diplomacy with North Korea if our uh, open hand uh, is unsuccessful. What has really changed in 20 years of diplomacy with respect to North Korea, 
20 years ago, North Korea had more international engagement, some with China, but many other countries. Today, North Korea is fundamentally a vassal state of China. And uh, despite the fact, I find it interesting, sometimes when we have engagement with Chinese friends, they will say, you know, what they want to happen here or there in the world, we're talking about the Philippines or India or whatever, and they will talk about this or that. But when the subject of North Korea comes up, they'll say, no, we have no influence here. We can't do that. I think it's going to be um, uh, important for China to recognize that if this path continues, we will likely face a crisis on the Korean Peninsula so that will not be in the strategic best interest of China for the world. So let me conclude more generally with what's going to be important for the United States over the course of the next few years. Um, everywhere I go, uh, every single day, someone asks me, boy, don't you think we're not on the right track, track in Asia? And for all your talk of a pivot or rebalance, uh, you know, it's not happening. Um, I, I want to say simply that I reject that. I, I think despite the fact that we are engaged on a intense basis in the Middle East, beneath the surface there are signs at a strategic level that we are uh, turning our great battleship of state more towards the Asian Pacific region. And everyone I talk to in my government and also on Capitol Hill who has an interest in Asia recognizes that this is going to be the fundamental uh, focus of the United States going forward. The key is whether we're going to be able to settle on the right strategy, train the people. Uh, basically, the most important ingredient in our success in Asia is our own uh, strength of our economy and the vitality of our, of our political system. The most questions I get are not about whether we're pivoting or rebalancing effectively, but whether we're up to it, whether our system of government, which we're in a competition here as well, is up to the challenges of the 21st century, and whether the United States is strong enough uh, to survive the challenges ahead. All, all I would say is I urge all of you to take a look at Joseph Joplin's great book about American decline and basically traces the last 50 years, and every five or six years, there's been a very robust debate about how the United States is in the midst of an absolutely just un, you know, nose dive into the ground of decline. And each time, after the Vietnam War, after the Korean War, after the Cold War, more recently, we have seen that the United States sometimes has hidden reserves, capabilities, that people take for granted. Now, I would tell you quite directly that if you look at the underlying indicators, I would know a little bit about that from you know the table conversation. The United States has remarkable resources and has been in the midst of another quiet revolution with respect to uh, economic performance. And we will likely see very strong indicators of growth going forward. And I think we, if we husband our resources carefully, if we demonstrate our leadership, we'll be able to play a leading role in Asia and the world going forward. And I have no doubt about that for decades. I think there are places in Asia that have some doubts, and it's going to be some are worried about it, some are happy about it. Our role is to make clear to friends and others that we are going to play a role in the Asian Pacific region going forward. I really would suggest to all of you, though, that the real challenge ahead is likely to be around strategy. Now, Frank and others in the room understand this very clearly. So think of the Asianist community in the United States as like all of you have gone on vacation when you were young at some little village resort, and it's just great. And it's and you know all the people, and you know the bakery, and it has problems, but you know the, the place, right? And then suddenly, large duplexes are coming in, and it's not the same place. And that is what's happening to Asian policy. More and more strategists who have no experience in Asia, others are coming in, and it, it is there's more tumult and more debate. But fundamentally, in the making of Asia strategy, for the last 40 years, there have fundamentally been essentially two schools of thought. There are others, you know, but basically two schools of thought. And I would uh, tell you what we tried to do was to indicate that those two schools of thought were inadequate to the challenges they had. The first school, which is the one that has been animated at the White House at the most senior levels of our government for decades, 
is the idea, perhaps not always uh, expressed directly and openly, but that if you get China like, and if you focus your strategic energies on developing this relationship with China, then the rest of Asia will fall in place, right? So it's, it's a pendulum strategy. And I see a few people shaking their heads in the crowd. Trust me, this is a very important strategic strain in American thinking. And it really begins at the time in the 1970s. Now, the only thing I'll say to that overall approach, you know, U.S.-China relations are extraordinarily important, and they cannot be uh, uh, shunted to the side. But the problem with that approach, particularly in the current environment, is that sometimes it comes to be seen as a replica of tributary politics of a different era in Chinese history, coming to the great middle kingdom to pay respects. And unfortunately, when there's too much focus in that arena, other countries in the region get nervous and anxious. They want to see good relations between the United States and China, but not too good. They do not want a common menu, and they certainly don't want the United States and China to veer towards conflict. One of the animating features of Asia, which is not well understood by many Americans, is that every country in Asia wants a better relationship with China. And that's just a fact. Some suggest that because of these issues in the South China Sea, that it was driving countries more towards the United States. No, it's driving them to be extraordinarily worried and anxious, and they do want the United States around, but every country wants a good relationship with the United States. And that has to be the basis of our understanding of modern Asia. So the second school of thought, and that first school of thought, basically every prominent national security advisor, many presidents, many of the big thinkers would subtly fall in that school. The second school is prominent in the Pentagon and elsewhere, but not nearly as well known. Uh, and that's the group that believes that the best way to manage the challenges of Asia, difficulties across the Taiwan Strait, uh, uncertainties on the Korean Peninsula, is through strong alliance relationships. And that you spend your time working with Japan and South Korea and Australia with Thailand and the Philippines, perhaps slightly lesser extent, and that's the way to focus on uh, the dramas of Asia as a whole. I think one of the problems with that approach, not the problems or the challenges, is that often these details are extraordinarily difficult and time consuming. How long is the runway at a military base? What do you do with the fuel that's deposited there? Who has to pay for it? It, it is a series of intractable, difficult problems. And it's not as sexy or romantic as Kissinger and Show Lai sitting and talking about the French Revolution, right? That's not as captivating, but it is nevertheless necessary. So I think what Secretary Clinton tried to do, and hopefully I believe will be an enduring feature of American diplomacy, is to articulate the vision that neither of those approaches are adequate and that we needed a new, much more comprehensive vision that articulates an American role in the 21st century. First and foremost is a recognition that our alliances are at the heart of what we're about in Asia, and that we must do what we can to sustain them. I will say I'm very proud of the fact I do not believe U.S.-South Korean relations have ever been stronger, and I think that's an important feature of stability going forward. But one always has to recognize and pay the appropriate respects to these strategic alliances and to begin to expand on them as well. Secondly, recognizing that a better relationship with China is essential and to focus attention on that and recognize that one, one of the most important things going forward is not erecting large sort of billboard like, you know, great new strategic partnership, right? So, so, so we spend an enormous amount of time working on the banner. What really needs to happen now in the time I have is the United States and China have to build habits of cooperation on climate change, on issues associated with, with dealing with humanitarian response, every challenge that we face in the Asia Pacific region. And I will tell you, my biggest frustration working in government is I try on innumerable occasions to get China to work with the United States constructively for a host of reasons, bureaucratics, suspicions, I'm not sure what else. Very hard to get China to actually cooperate with the United States. We finally managed to get a project on disaster relief and 
uh, help and assistance in uh, teamwork, right? So after working four years, finally managed to make a breakthrough there. That, that's just not the way it's, that's not going to cut it in the 21st century. We're going to need to break through China's resistance. Now, recently, President Obama, you know, some were concerned by this, talked about being you know, free riding. Very much upset China's friends. I, I accept that. And it's hard to hear from a chief executive. But what's clear is that we, we must, of course, there are aspects of the international community, the operating system of Asia that China wants to change. But that does not mean that there aren't areas that China can work more actively with the United States. I would have loved to see when Susan Rice was visiting Beijing a more active commitment on the part of China, recognizing that what is going on in Iraq affects their interests, and that joining war with the international community is in their best interests. And I would have put a lot of pressure and a lot of things on the table to get more active engagement from China going forward. But recognizing that building this relationship with China is going to be difficult, but it is essential. And what I would suggest to you is that fundamentally, we are involved in two different kinds of conversations. And I know that people don't like this phraseology, but essentially what we have been about for decades now is to try to get China to understand that we need a 21st century relationship in which they work to sustain the operating system that has been so good to China in Asia. Rules, laws, freedom of navigation, open discourse on commerce and the like, and to lend a hand into supporting the best four years of China. And despite the fact that there's an enormous amount of strategic commentary in China about the nefarious, uh, uh, you know, underhanded actions occasionally of American friends. I would defy Chinese friends to come up with any other country that has spent as much time supporting China and helping China over the course of the last 50 years. It's a very important feature of American foreign policy, which we are frankly proud of, and we want to continue going forward. I think what China sometimes prefers is rather than a 21st century conversation, really a 19th century one. What I have found in every discussion around a joint statement or some sort of communique is China wants from the United States an agreement that there will be areas around China that are essentially about spheres of influence. And one of the things that we have to be careful about is that we're not in the business of subjugating whole regions and groups of nations. Uh, to live under uh, uh, domination. It's not in China's interest, frankly, certainly not in this country's interest, and it will not help us in the maintenance of peace and stability. And so this interplay will continue between the United States and China, but ultimately, I'm confident that both nations, despite the strong and drawn, are committed to maintaining this relationship in the 21st century. We don't have another choice, ladies and gentlemen. This is, what, this is our destiny. We must learn to work together. And I myself am quite confident that the United States and China have the wherewithal to do it. And I will tell you, despite all this you know, discussion in international relations theory that we're destined a rising state and an established state and looking at the case studies, I would say the most important feature that is different about this rising state, particularly with respect to Germany before the first and the second world wars, the international community denied Germany its proper place did not encourage it to play a role. In fact, shunned it in international uh, uh, stature. If anything, the United States has gone out of its way to encourage China to play an active role, insisted expanding uh, uh, into the G20, working on uh, global trade pacts, asking them to participate. In that. It has been China that has been more recalcitrant about participation on the global stage. And so I'm confident that over time, that we can make, uh, find that common area where the United States adjusts some, but also China recognizes that we're not going anywhere in Asia, and that we have strategic interests here, and they need to understand it. But our strategy cannot end there. We must have a much, number three, a much more activist multilateral stance. So we must be much more engaged and enthusiastic, working with partners, sometimes not leading initiatives, sometimes supporting them quietly in the East Asia Summit, in the ASEAN Regional Forum. Now these organizations sometimes look to others just like alphabet soup. Nothing could be further from the truth. When you're actually in these meetings, you recognize they matter enormously. They have to be imbued with stature. 
and with commitment. And one of the things that we learned from Europe is that when organizations build secretariats, and this may seem hopelessly bureaucratic, but it is in fact the case, when they build secretariats at NATO and the EU and in the OECD, they start to take on momentum and capacity. That process is beginning in Asia. It must take off. Uh, we have now a, uh, a institution set up in Jakarta that more needs to be done going forward. But multilateral, minilateral uh, engagements are critical. For I'm a Democrat. I uh, stand against my party on this. TPP is essential. If the United States does everything wrong in Asia in the next two or three years and gets TPP passed, we get a passing grade, maybe even a B. If we do everything right, lots of high-level engagement, great, in, great speeches, stand tough against provocations, and we do not get TPP, we still can. It's that important. We do not have a choice. We've got to get it done. And as importantly, we have to start articulating and thinking about round two. And round two involves not only our Korean friends, but China. We need to be able to discuss with China. And quietly, China has studied what has gone on in Japan. She is involved in a massive effort to go after state of enterprises. What country in that respect faces some of the same structural problems? Japan. Abe has very effectively used the politics around TPP as a crowbar to go after its own, his own very entrenched uh, domestic interests. I think uh, uh, President Xi is looking at the same. We need uh, a clear, robust, optimistic economic strategy. That's uh, number four. Number five, we have to continue the process unapologetically of uh, rebalancing and sustaining and beefing up our forces in Asia. And the process of that means more partnerships with other countries, more capacity building, and recognizing that most of our posture is hopelessly uh, 1940s, right? It needs to be much more dispersed uh, throughout Asia. We need to work more with Southeast Asian friends. We need to recognize operational concepts that link the Indian with the Pacific Ocean. This is essential, and recognize that working with other countries will be important. Frankly, you think what needs to take place here is military leadership. That's not the case, actually. Military leadership too often is involved in narrow parochial uh, military interests. It has to be led by a strong Secretary of Defense, strong Deputy Secretary. It's been difficult during a period where, frankly, most of the challenges are either in Capitol Hill or in the Middle East. But articulating a vision for this sort of uh, uh, dispersal of engagement is going to be important. In fact, we have the resources we need, despite all the worries. Much of it, however, is being put in uh, very difficult places where it's harder to reshuffle. We have no uh, military construction budget at all. We end up fighting with Australians about who's going to build ponds and hunts uh, in uh, northern Australia. That's unbecoming. We've got to find the resources, the willpower, to be able to articulate this case. Just the last two things, then I'll turn it over to a question and answer, and I appreciate your patience here. I would also say that the biggest mistake I made, um, if I could tell you guys about policy making, 99 times out of 100, when you advance an idea that you think is good or big, it immediately disappears, right? And you throw it at people and say, look, this is a really big thing. They're like, I don't care. And certainly not interesting to me, right? It's only happened really once to me that worked on something that turned out to be bigger than we anticipated. And that was a series of speeches and an article that Secretary Clinton uh, uh, authored that used the word the pivot, right? And then it articulated the strategy for the way forward. And then from there, it just exploded and it took off. For a while, there was a lot of debate about which was the right term. When we used pivot, we thought of it more as a basketball term to be able to go back and forth. But of course, it was perceived as the United States turning its back on the Middle East and on Europe. It's a terrible, wrong message. And in fact, one of the most important ingredients in a strong Asia policy is for the United States to work more closely with Europe. It is essential. We started that process, but frankly, there are so many urgent media tasks when Americans and Europeans get together. It's often the last topic on the agenda. Europe has an enormous amount to bring to the table at an aggregate level more assistance comes from Europe than any other country in the world towards uh, uh, Asia. They have similar uh, intellectual property, macroeconomic problems that other countries have, particularly with China. 
they've been very effective in behind the scenes diplomacy in countries like Myanmar. And they have a lot to teach Asia about mending historical offenses, given their own experience in the 1970s and 80s in Europe. So I'm very bullish. I want to see more dialogue. I want to bring Europeans in more. And so that message that we had inadvertently sent was inappropriate. And I wish I could go back and do some of that again. But frankly, it was not anticipating the way it took off. I remember people would stop me sometimes and ask me, like, about what does this particular line mean? And I, I remember thinking I wrote that, I edited that late at night. I have no idea. It's even there. They're treating it like kind of a biblical statement to them how to, how to think about it. And just one funny aside, that for a period, the White House, the NSC, didn't want us to use the word pivot. And we were pretty much instructed that we would use the word rebalance. So some of us were sent to re-education camps. <laughs> I, I had to, if you've seen the killing fields, I had a red scarf and a cloak. I lived, I dug at the trenches. And so I always used rebalance for several months uh, to find that the president preferred the term pivot. So we found ourselves in sort of an awkward sense. But the, 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 the truth is, the concept underneath it is just a recognition that really the future belongs to the Asia Pacific region. The United States has to step up its game. But still, I have tensions uh, about that topic. I'll, I'll tell this to the president. Not only do I have a great wife and I have great young children, I have a six-year-old daughter who dances ballet. Uh, before I left, that, uh, my wife was voting on the, uh, one of the Fed uh, things, and I took my daughter. Uh, to ballet. A couple of weeks ago, I was in the same ballet class, and a very charming 18, 19 year old teacher is telling all the girls in their little pink tutus, now girls, pivot, pivot, and I'm getting more, <laughs> more and more agitated. The more she talks, and I almost stop and say, don't you mean rebalance? <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, ultimately, we have enormous challenges on the Korean Peninsula. The larger context is difficult. But frankly, if you're going to confront problems and challenges, you want to do it with good friends. And despite difficulties and challenges, there's no relationship in Asia that I'm more bullish about and more optimistic about than the United States' relationship with South Korea. And despite our difficulties and sometimes our back and forth, ultimately, we have built a tried and trusted relationship that's based on defense. But now, not just defense. It's people to people. It's innovation and the like that is remarkable and it will be enduring. Thank you very much, President. Since I've been in Korea, I've never had more help and more advice about every single thing. I want to give the President a
to invite North Korea to talk about the unification agenda. So uh, there is a kind of need to be for South Korean government to implement a more flexible approach to these two important agenda. And obviously, that is related to the American cooperation, I guess. So if, uh, how can you advise uh, the South Koreans on this issue pursuing two rather seemingly contradictory agenda in the realization of North Korea and also the cooperation toward becoming a one Korea thing? Thank you, President. And, and if I could, I'd like to just offer maybe a, a, some slight nuances to that, um, to that interpretation. I think the primary initial target towards the concept of unification uh, is, is, is not North Korea, it's China. And, and, and having China recognize that the, that the direction of history and the necessity of change. It, this will not be something that will happen immediately overnight, but will uh, build and will be discussed more generally in China over time. And so I don't think we can have any um, uh, particular optimism that in the current environment that the North Korean leadership is going to say, I don't know why we didn't think about this. Unification is a great idea. You know, uh, we'll relinquish our power and South Korea will be the dominant force on the Korean Peninsula. That's, that's not going to happen. But I do think there are some intermediate steps that might be possible that could take place around some economic engagements, some uh, family exchanges, other things that could at least build a modicum of trust that I believe lies somewhere below the um, tripwire that would suggest that we are somehow looking away from the ultimate goal of denuclearification, uh, 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 denuclear North Korea. I, I would say two other things, if I might, uh, here. But I, we, we talk often about North Korea with, in reference to really all, only one manifestation of its power which is really its, its nuclear agenda. I think that's extremely important and worrisome. It cannot be relegated. But I have to say, I find myself increasingly drawn to the issues associated with the plight of the North Korean people. Now, I, I know that often that agenda has been used by the hard right as a way to go after North Korea, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves that increasingly drawing attention to what's going on in the gulags, what's going on with respect to treatment of many people inside the country, this is not something that we can shut from our minds and our eyes. We have to recognize it, and I think we have to raise it with North Korea and China, as difficult as it is and as little as North Koreans want to hear about it. It has to become a more um, regular theme in our diplomacy, as it is in almost every other situation with such an abysmal human rights uh, uh, record. Um, what I thought you were going to ask, um, Madam President, about North Korea was that essentially what we've seen, the response that we've seen from South North Korea, I'm not sure it's a response, but certainly what we've seen in recent months as the talk of unification and the analysis of it has spread in South Korea and indeed in Northeast Asia, what you hear in a defiant tone more from North Korea is that we are a nuclear power and we're not going to give that up. Ultimately, down that path creates real difficulties for us because in fact, North Korea did sign up for a number of agreements and understandings that have to do with its nuclear status. And I think if we, if any of us decide to go back to fundamental negotiations and not regard this as our foundation, I think it would inadvertently send the wrong message, not just to North Korea, but to other would-be proliferators. So I recognize that we're in a very delicate phase right now. And the United States and other countries have been very clear about what our demands are. But I will say this, I, I think the next phase of diplomacy in the past it has often been the case that the United States, or maybe the United States and China, has been the driving force on diplomacy, with diplomacy, 
on the Korean Peninsula. And I think that has sometimes been quietly difficult for South Koreans. And I think the new dynamics and the international prestige and the reality of South Korea suggests to me that one of the most important innovations that we've seen more recently in the American approach. South Korea may be a little bit unhappy with the sense of firmness on the part of the United States. However, we're clear that South Korea is increasingly taking the lead in defining the parameters of engagement with North Korea, rather than having to wait in the back. Now, it is clear that North Korea sometimes does not prefer that, but South Korea is stepping up to play that role more. I think that's very much in the best interest of the world. Uh, okay, one more question. Actually, South Korean government want to meet this negotiation vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea and discouraging their nuclear weapons. And obviously, North Korea is not by the, the Korean suggestions, including the uh, initiative. You mentioned the uh, US-China relationship is very important, especially in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, how do you see uh, kind of a converging interest between USA and China in uh, persuading North Korea to give up a nuclear weapons program? Well, those are the hard, the, the way you present it is the hardest, sort of the most stark possibilities. I think the more likely dynamic, I, I think, frankly, the United States push too hard, even in private. I, I think there is, this, there is distrust around these issues between the United States and China. We have a few areas of common ground, but there is a lot of anxiety. And so I think, I think the prudence would suggest that Beijing and Washington have to be very careful here. My own personal view is that what needs to happen is the United States and South Korea must weigh in more with China to put pressure on North Korea to move forward on some form of diplomacy. My own personal view is that China has the wherewithal to make that happen. We, we've seen China, when it needs to, use pressure very effectively with Vietnam, with the Philippines, when those countries are moving in directions that they feel are not in their best interest in Taiwan. I would think that what we're seeing with North Korea would basically be classified as taking steps that are not in China's best strategic interests. And a little bit more private pressure from China and North Korea, I think, would cause the leadership there to recognize that it has very few friends and it better be careful not to alienate its really last true and important one. Thank you. Uh, let me open up to the audience. Uh, we, okay, John first. At one point, uh, when you're talking about the need to uh, be either ill prepared or really ill prepared for an eventual uh, North Korean collapse, eventual change on the peninsula, uh, you said that you're talking to the South Koreans about this, uh, but you really need to reach out and to engage China too. Amen. But for a long time now, the US government has been reaching out to China to try to engage it in just that kind of dialogue. And the shutters have gone slamming down. China simply does not seem prepared to talk to you about this very important matter anytime soon. What do you think might be on this set? Ambassador, thank you. And I hope I get a chance. I, we, uh, your predecessors were always terrific, all, all, more away than others would always come through Washington. Some of our most interesting insights came from uh, your uh, you know, views and uh, examinations on the ground. So I hope you'll have a few minutes to talk with me while, while we're here. Um, let me say that it is not true that we have not had dialogue with China. We have had a couple of dialogues with China, but they are uneasy. Um, and I'll just give you an example. But the most successful one probably took place in the 1990s. That's a long time ago. And the ground rules initially were that we would talk, we would paint a picture of where we are, and the Chinese would listen. So that was the ground rules. So there was very little back and forth interaction. I think what has happened subsequently is, in truth, there's no country that uses track two more effectively than China. And so sometimes when issues are not right or too sensitive, they are often used uh, explored in the track to arena, oftentimes with South Korean friends. And we have had 
some very interesting uh, discussions. And frankly, a lot of uh, important analysis has taken place more generally. I, I think the, the worry on the part of Chinese friends is um, it's not so much they are wedded absolutely to the status quo. I think they would be prepared to accept certain aspects of adjustment over time. But the actual confronting of that reality uh, is extraordinarily difficult. If there was any sense that it would leak, particularly if it was a consequential dialogue, I think, um, I think that would cause very real uh, worries to Chinese friends. And I think they have every reason to believe given the recent experience in the United States, that anything of consequence will be leaked. So I, I, I think there are a lot of reasons that animate their anxiety. I would say more recently, Ambassador, your analysis is correct. We, we went at the highest levels in the most discreet possible way, and we had some general unwillingness to have that kind of strategic engagement at the level of the National Security Advisor and one. However, there was also a quiet understanding of certain track twos. And I think we believe that some of that information, some of those views, have trickled up to the top of the higher levels inside the Chinese government. In the current environment, though, with all the uncertainties, the Chinese government is not prepared to accept the idea that they would play a role that might lead to instability or uncertainty on the At least currently. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture, wonderful as usual. So, yeah, my question is very simple. I don't know about uh, the answer. Uh, how do you see a role of Russia and Russia-American cooperation in Asia Pacific? Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I want to commend my friend who does some of the best analysis um, on leadership issues in, in North Korea. And I've always appreciated this council. Um, Look, the, the truth is, for we're in a very difficult situation in which the focus of Russia and U.S. policy currently, the, 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 uh, the gyrating center is not in Asia, it is in Ukraine. And the problem is that I think it is, even though I understand and accept and support all the various steps, but it has put in place a number of developments in Asia that over the medium or longer term are probably not in American strategic interests. What are those? I think it has driven Russia and China together in a very profound way. I think quietly Russian friends um, have always you know, wanted to work with China but had some ambivalence. I think that ambivalence has been shown. And so militarily, obviously, but also in terms of uh, strategic assets that are for sale that China is investing in, that relationship has gotten a lot stronger. I also, I think that it is in the best interest over the longer term that the United States see that Russia has other avenues of entry into Asia other than just China. We've seen a little bit with respect to South Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, but ultimately there should be a better relationship between Japan and Russia. For the first time in living memory, it looked as if Putin and Abe had found a way to deal with some of these issues. And because of the developments in Ukraine, that has to be put on hold for now. And it's not clear that it can be resurrected. We've gotten close before with regard to the disputed territories and how to basically link Japan and Russia together only to have those hopes dash. But, but I believe that Russia that Russia and Chinese views are not identical in Asia. Russia has its own strategic interests. I think the United States and Russia can work on a few things together. We find that on issues associated with maritime interpretations, that Russia's position, frankly, is closer to the United States with respect to freedom of seas. Russia quietly and sometimes forcefully has taken strong positions on the Korean Peninsula with respect to North Korean provocations that I think has been helpful. And I think ultimately, uh, Russia's contribution in multilateral forum have um, on occasion been helpful with respect to creating capacity 
associated with humanitarian relief and the like. But right now, all of that's on hold. All of that has been put uh, pushed to the side or discontinued. I would like to think that in an environment where there's very little going on between the United States and Russia, that there might be the opportunity for some side discussions between the United States and Russia. In fact, I was involved with one a couple of weeks ago. But ultimately, it's not going to get the kind of attention unless we can get U.S. Russia relations and Russia European relations back on a more positive track. But we should have no illusions that this is hurting some of our strategic interests as a nation going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take a question from the Korean Press. Thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Uh, my name is Park. I used to work at Foreign Ministry as an ambassador to uh, Finland. It's kind of a revelation that you... Uh, what were you about to do, sir? I'm sorry to say. Finland, in Finland. Finland. I met you at Washington. You yes, I remember. Of the yeah. <laughs> Assembly. Anyway, um, it's quite a revelation that you said that uh, the level of sanctions on North Korea is uh, much, much bigger than that we had uh, vis-a-vis uh, uh, Myanmar, maybe 10 times weaker. It's quite a revelation. And then my question is, why don't you uh, try, try it now? Do you think you can do it with, uh, without the help of China, for instance? And can it be effective? Look, we, in the last five years, we have learned an enormous amount about financial sanctions. And they've been applied in a number of circumstances quite effectively. If we chose to, it may create unhappiness in Beijing. But we could do it. And it would, be, it would have a, a very consequential impact on I'm not sure in the current environment, though. I, I think we have to be closer to line with South Korea. Um, I also think that we need to recognize that uh, that there are consequences to doing that. It would, it would raise tension substantially. So I would not do it uh, as a, without a, a deep provocation from the North. But I'm simply pointing out that what we have seen with respect to American sanctions in Iran suggests to me that if we sought to, we could make life much more difficult in North Korea than we have. And, and, and I want us to recognize that that is another arrow in our quiver. I would personally not advise using it unless North Korea took steps that were deeply antithetical to the maintenance of peace and stability. But I would be very clear with them and China that we be prepared to take those steps. If they did something that uh, harmed South Koreans or created a military crisis that was um, provocative in a way that uh, threatened the dominions of the stability. Okay. Other questions? Yes, over there. And, and can I also say, Ambassador Swan, I, I, I mean, I think tend to, I, I, I probably was a little bit general, general there. I, I would simply say that the sanctions regime on Myanmar combines about 50 different interlock just and untangling it is very difficult. It's very difficult to invest, very difficult. We have a much less robust sanction regime, and we've never used financial, really gone after financial sanctions in North Korea in the way we have in Iran. I should have said it more precisely, and I hope that's the way it's captured. Yes, correct. Uh, I am a Professor Chung. My question is that in the uh, early 1990s, we, you withdrew the uh, tactical nuclear weapons from the peninsula, expecting that North Korea could keep their promise to go to the uh, denuclearization of the peninsula. However, for the 10 uh, and more years, the situation has been worsened and worsened. So do you think that, uh, uh, why don't you reintroduction uh, re of the U.S. Tactical, tactical nuclear weapon to the peninsula? Or at least you can uh, acknowledge that South Korea can uh, do the process procedure of the uh, spent fuel that is very uh, uh, dangerous in the sense of tactical reason because we have no uh, no more uh, storage uh, space, and also as well as 
we can uh, prepare for the possible uh, uh, deploy some weapon against some, uh, North Korea. So, you have any uh, opinion on that? Well, I, I, I mean, they, they really are two separate issues. And when Korean negotiators talk about the 1 3 agreement, they do not talk about it as a precursor towards building a nuclear weapon. I know you understand that, Professor. But, 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 and in fact, it takes pains to try to convince the United States interlocutors that that's not what they have in mind. I, I would simply say one of the most important ingredients in effective American strategic policy in Asia is the regular, at a high level, enunciation of our deterrent policy, which requires uh, important understanding of the nuclear problem. And I think we have the wherewithal, militarily and strategically, to make a very clear statement that South Korea is under that umbrella. I do not believe personally that the application or the reintroduction of new tactical nuclear weapons uh, is important in that larger equation. In fact, I think it could be perceived very negatively in South Korea and would likely trigger a series of re-examinations that I don't think would be in the strategic best interests of South Korea, the United States, other countries as a whole. So my general proposition to you would be, let's take the one, two, three agreement on its own. Our negotiators are working towards that. I think we have to respect and acknowledge South Korea's role as a very respectable uh, member of the international community. And you must work with them to help sustain their nuclear uh, industry. I'll leave it to the negotiators, but I, I've negotiated a lot with, with South Korean friends. I know what those negotiations are like. I'm sure while we're having this lovely session, some of negotiators are, are going at it in the room. I have confidence that they'll be able to come to some agreement that meets our best strategic interests. On the nuclear umbrella, the President and others have articulated a strong view that extended deterrence is applicable, both in Japan and South Korea. We have to make it very clear that we will not broach uh, provocations that risk uh, 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 an abrupt uh, challenge uh, to peace and stability. And we've tried to do that in a number of circumstances, whether it's on disputed islands or provocations from North Korea. I don't think there can be any doubt that the United States is standing with uh, uh, South Korea. And I do not believe that there are any questions in North Korea about that. Dr. Campbell, uh, let me ask mine as a last question okay. in this Q&A session. And you have very good friends in both uh, Seoul and, and Tokyo and worried about the diverging relationship between Korea and Japan, which are very important allies to the USA. Uh, I guess many Korean experts uh, know the importance of the security cooperation with uh, Japan, but uh, dissociating um, history issues from the security <laughs> corporation uh, is not easy. Uh, so how, how would you see the role of the U.S. in this uh, very uh, delicate issue of uh, its uh, history issues between two nations? President, you put it so delicately, I could not agree with that. I, I love the way you described it. It is very hard for the United States. And you know, the big worry is that somehow someone will say something and we will be perceived as quote, quote, taking sides. And I hear sometimes people say, oh, you're taking the Korean side on a, a particular issue. I, I, I would, I attempt, and I know it's difficult to disaggregate the issues of history and questions associated with contemporary international relations. I don't think there's any secret that we strongly support Prime Minister Abe's attempts to revitalize the economy. We're working with him on issues associated with modernizing our alliance and recognizing some of the challenges that he's facing, dealing with collective self-defense. These, I think, are important contributions to um, modern maintenance of peace and stability in Northeast Asia. I also think that the idea that what we're seeing in Japan is some, somehow 
akin to Asia in the 1930s is inaccurate, wrong, and frankly insulting to Japanese friends. We don't hear that as much in Japan, in Korea, as we hear in some other capitals. But basically, most of the checks and balances that exist on issues associated with reinterpreting the Constitution and how far and how fast Japan should go are in the Japanese domestic politics itself. There is a very strong commitment to peace and dialogue. So I would just simply say that a lot of this is unfortunate uh, in that respect. But lastly, look, um, I think we've been very clear some of these historical illusions and resurrection of, of, of perspectives are not in the best strategic interests of Japan uh, or the region as a whole. And our preference would be to leave Sometimes people say, let's leave history to the historians. Let's focus on modern issues. That's trite, probably um, not uh, uh, possible in all circumstances. But ultimately, uh, some of the issues that we have seen quietly try to advise Japanese friends about why some of those interpretations and positions are not helpful and create uh, hurt feelings and uh, frankly do not advance Japan's strategic interests. Um, hopefully over time that we will be able to communicate these concepts and these views in a way that are deeply respectful to Japan, but also clear with respect to our own values and our own beliefs about what transpired historically. So it puts us in an incredibly delicate position. And you've seen what I've just done which I've tried to answer a complex issue, and it took me five minutes to try to talk about it. And I'm sure that some part of that, as it happens every time, is taken out of its larger context. And tomorrow I'll have 50 emails about how I've offended good friends. It's not my intention, but I also recognize personally that what's going on between Japan and South Korea could not hurt U.S. interests. Yeah. I'd like to continue the conversation with Dr. Campbell, but he just arrived so this morning, so I think that we have to let him go yeah. at this moment. Uh, sorry for not taking any questions now. Uh, Dr. Campbell, as usual, it was a great lecture and a great hearing. Uh, we'd like to thank him with a big hand clap. Thank you very much.